You wouldn't know that the desert spread out in front of me was the site of America's deadliest nuclear accident, a disaster that left three men dead and spewed clouds of radioactive gases into the air. There are no visible signs of the meltdown, no burned out buildings or barren patches of earth. SL1 is long gone, and the cracked asphalt road that leads to where it once stood lies behind a locked green gate and a brightly colored restricted area sign. So all you'll see, aside from some skittish jackrabbits, are hundreds of acres of sharp, black, hardened lava rock, dusty green sagebrush, and the whistling wind. The nearest town is miles away, and it's not a place where you'd want to put down stakes. Early settlers tried to eke out a living on this land and failed. And even the ancestors of today's Shoshone and Bannock tribes only spent time here in the spring when there was water, before they moved on to more hospitable landscapes. It's not a welcoming environment by any stretch. Looking at this expanse of isolation is an obvious reminder of why, exactly, the U.S. government decided that this was the place to build the National Reactor Testing Station, the site. I'm standing outside a squat brick building, utilitarian, nondescript, beige. It's got that 1950s feel, and it probably wouldn't even catch your attention if it didn't have a locked chain link fence topped with razor wire and a huge turquoise sign proclaiming EBR-1, world's first nuclear power plant. In 1951, just 10 years before the SL-1 accident, it was the cutting edge of nuclear technology and the future of energy. I'm Laura Krantz, and this is Wild Thing, Going Nuclear, a series about the power of the universe, contained in the tiny little package of the atom. You and I are living in the atomic age. The endless debate over harnessing that power. The mysteries of the universe. And whether we humans are responsible enough to mess with it. Of benefit or of destruction. Of good or of evil. EBR-1, Experimental Breeder Reactor 1, was the first reactor at the National Reactor Testing Station, and the first in the world to make a usable amount of electricity. On December 20th, 1951, it spat out enough energy to power four, four, 200-watt light bulbs hanging from a handrail inside the reactor building, which sounds underwhelming, but at the time was considered some pretty heady stuff. Scientists knew that they could use nuclear energy to generate electricity, but they hadn't actually done it yet. So those four light bulbs represented a tiny step toward a pretty exciting future. EBR-1 would eventually ramp up to create enough energy to power itself. And it was just the first reactor of many to be built at the NRTS, including SL-1, as Don Miley, the former tour director for the Idaho National Laboratory, points out. The intent was come out here, build 10 nuclear reactors, run them for 15 years total. That was it. And that is all the more research you would need to do to understand nuclear power. Well, they built those first reactors, they started answering questions, but that led to more questions and more theories, and they just kept building. As I mentioned in the last episode, SL-1 was not just an experimental reactor. It was also a school of sorts. So if you were interested in nuclear science and the great nuclear future that was being promised, or if you were a young military man looking for a chance at promotion, this was the place to be. And in that spirit, thousands of men came to Idaho in the 1950s, including Dick Legg and Jack Burns. According to Todd Tucker, who wrote the book Atomic America, They were relatively young, active-duty military guys in their 20s. They were relatively new to the plant relatively junior military personnel. Richard Lake, who went by Dick, was a Navy CB originally from Michigan. Jack Burns was an Army specialist from New York. And while both men had qualified for the nuclear reactor program and made it through eight months of tests and training, meaning they were ostensibly bright and capable, they also had some fairly significant personal issues. In one of the many official reports that came out after the incident, they said that Leg had, quote, small man complex. So he was constantly kind of asserting himself physically, and a lot of people attribute that to his height. Uh, he had had a number of kind of professional issues. In December of 1960, he had lied to cover for a friend and had been caught. A supervisor challenged him, and he had challenged that supervisor to a fight. Leg was also something of a prankster, always joking around, setting off alarms to freak people out, and known for goosing unsuspecting colleagues. 
Jack Burns had his own set of problems. His wife had left him days before the incident, or they'd separated, depending on how you look at it. Um, and uh, he had been living on the couches of friends in the days uh, leading up to the incident. Uh, him and his wife, Arlene, had fought constantly. While he was at work on January 3rd, 1961, the evening of the SL-1 disaster, Burns reportedly received a phone call from his wife saying she wanted a divorce, which probably wouldn't have shocked his comrades. He's known for being a hothead. Um, he, he was a fighter and he was, um, by all accounts, like not a great husband. Him and his wife are kind of a topic of some gossip uh, around the site. Given their reputations, it's not at all surprising to hear that Leg and Burns did not particularly get along with each other. I think it would also be fair to say they, they were, didn't get along with lots of people. <laughs> In fact, the two men actually came to blows at one point, about six months before the accident. So they had personal animosity in their past. He and Leg had actually been in a fist fight, um, kind of a drunken pushing and shoving thing after midnight at a bachelor party. As I mentioned in the last episode, each class of men who came to SL1 to train was split into crews of three, known as cadres. Leg and Burns had arrived in the same class and were part of the same cadre, but Leg was eventually promoted which didn't sit well with Burns. And with Leg qualifying, um, chief operator and shift supervisor, he had kind of surpassed Burns, which no, no doubt probably galled Burns that he was now kind of taking direction from this person that had been a, you know, a class, a peer of his. To make things even more complicated, neither man had much experience. Just over a year of training at the site for Leg and Burns, and even less for the third member of their cadre, Richard McKinley, who had only been in Idaho for three weeks, that does not sound like very much time learning the ropes on an experimental reactor. But Todd Tucker pointed out that their inexperience wasn't all that unusual. You know, that's kind of the military way to kind of give young people lots of responsibility, usually coupled with, you know, experience, active leadership. Except these men weren't being supervised by any senior personnel. To have them kind of solely responsible for this nuclear reactor, that did jump out at me, I think. Their experience, such as it was, kind of required way more supervision than they got. At this point, you might think that these men were the reason SL-1 blew up. Angry, distracted, unsupervised, not to mention young and still learning the ropes. But let's go back to the design of the reactor, which Todd Tucker describes as... Problematic, and the thing was like, you know teetering on the verge of instability almost from day one. There were a lot of issues with that plan. It was just, it was just asking for trouble. Remember all those pluses I mentioned in the last episode? Simple design, no containment building, just five control rods, all to make the reactor more lightweight? Yeah, while those seemed like great ideas in theory, in practice, they created a lot of problems. For instance, if you remember, SL-1 was a boiling water reactor. In this type of reactor, water flows into the reactor vessel, which is the part that holds the fuel. The heat of all those fissioning atoms in the nuclear fuel causes the water to boil, creating steam. The steam turns a turbine, creating electricity. But all this piping hot steam under pressure inside the reactor core makes it more dangerous because it can overheat. Additionally, the steam is highly radioactive. That makes maintenance super difficult and breaks down the parts pretty quickly. Other reactor designs, like the ones the Navy used for their submarines, had a way of heating the steam in a separate system, which made the reactors more stable and the steam less radioactive. But those designs were more complex and required more equipment and more people to run them, which is what the Army wanted to avoid. There was also the lack of a containment building. Sure, SL-1 was relatively isolated in the desert, and it was a prototype for reactors that would be even more isolated up in the Arctic. But if an accident did happen, there was nothing to keep any escaping radioactivity in place. And then there's that simple design of just five control rods. Control rods are how operators raise and lower power levels in a reactor. The rods are poison to the reactor, um, and you slowly raise the rods to uh, remove this kind of poison from the core and bring the reactor to criticality. Criticality simply means that atoms are splitting apart and releasing energy. And conversely... So if the rods are all fully inserted into the core, it kills off the nuclear reaction. And that's that's supposed to be safe because, you know, that should be a fail-safe thing where if everything fails, 
gravity will bring these rods to the bottom of the plant and shut it down. Like he said, the rods are kind of atomic poison. They're made of those materials we learned about in an earlier episode. Graphite, boron, cadmium. Something that will slow down the chain reaction by absorbing some of the loose neutrons created by the fissioning uranium fuel. Control rods are extremely important, and in SL1, they pose something of a problem. The fuel rods themselves were, you know, it was kind of a poor design. The rods were arranged like the five dots on dice. And because there were only five of them, it meant that the center rod, rod nine, was way more powerful than the rest, simply because of its position. You have fewer rods, so that center rod number nine is is far more reactive just by virtue of its position in the exact geometric center of the core. So that that rod, fully withdrawn by itself, could make the reactor critical, and that rod fully inserted by itself could kill off the chain reaction. Basically, Rod 9 had enough power to start the reactor up or shut the whole thing down, all by itself. In every other reactor, that kind of power requires moving multiple control rods, but not SL1. I'm no nuclear engineer, but this seems problematic, especially since by 1959, SL1 had started to show some real wear and tear. There were like problems with the welds and the metallurgy. But the biggest problem, aside from the inherent design flaws, was that the control rods would frequently get stuck in their channels. This season of Wild Thing is supported solely by First Light Capital Group. Founded by female entrepreneur Alba Toll, First Light Capital Group is an innovative investment firm that strives to generate outstanding financial returns and change how the industry fosters talent and diversity. First Light has a dual-pronged mission. First, it trades public equities, private equities, and debt using its proprietary data-informed investment process. And second, through a separate seed fund, it seeks to cultivate the next generation of female entrepreneurs by providing women-led businesses in the technology and biotechnology sectors with the capital, infrastructure support, and mentorship needed to take their companies to the next level. To learn more about First Light Capital Group, please visit firstlightcapitalgroup.com. Wild Thing fans, I have a serious message for you. If you're not already talking to your kids about aliens, it's probably time to start. Just this year alone, the James Webb Space Telescope found distant planets that might harbor life. Archaeologists claimed to have found mummified aliens. And extraterrestrials even got a shout-out during congressional hearings. No doubt your kids are asking lots of questions, and it could be you're not sure how to answer them. Let me recommend my new book, Is There Anybody Out There? which arrives on Earth on October 3rd. This middle-grade book, based on season two of Wild Thing, explores the question of whether we're alone in the universe using science, humor, and fun illustrations. And it'll leave everyone better prepared for the possibility of alien life. Help kids learn how to tell the difference between science fact and science fiction. Look for Is There Anybody Out There in all bookstores and online. Or for more information, go to wildthingpodcast.com. So picture this. In SL1, the fuel was a mix of uranium and aluminum, pressed into plates and covered with more aluminum. A group of these plates is known as a fuel assembly, and they have enough space between them to allow water to move around and cool them down. All total, there were 40 fuel assemblies in the SL1 reactor, and the control rods slipped in and out of channels between the fuel assemblies, pushed the control rods all the way into the reactor, and they'd stop the fissioning process pull them all the way out, and the chain reaction would take off. To control the amount of power, the rods had to be able to move freely in and out of the reactor. And in case of an emergency, the rods had to be able to drop in all the way, with only gravity to assist. So if they were sticking, well, that created a fundamental problem. Records show that between February 1959, less than six months after SL1 first went critical, and December of 1960, the five control rods in SL1 stuck 63 separate times. And that center rod, rod number nine, the one that could basically start or stop the reactor all on its own, operators reported problems with it, sticking or moving too slowly on seven different occasions. So workers had to exercise the rods, regularly moving them up and down to keep them from sticking. It didn't help. 
The supervisors at SL-1, as well as the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, knew about the problem but didn't have a solution. And they may have thought that because SL-1 was just a prototype, there was no sense putting time and money into addressing it. They'd just keep these problems in mind when they built new reactors. So rather than fix the issue, everyone just worked around it. Everybody knew it was a problem. I'm not sure how, how much they saw it as dangerous. In the procedures, they seemed to be intent on finding a way to work around it rather than fixing it. I think it also was just kind of cultural, like, hey, we like, this is how we do things. If something breaks, we either fix it or figure out a way to live with it. Then came Christmas 1960. Every year, over the holidays, the Army would shut SL-1 down for maintenance, which was done by dropping all the control rods into the reactor. This year, three of the five rods stuck in their channels and had to be forced in manually. Between Christmas and New Year's, outside contractors came in to do extensive repairs on the reactor, although, interestingly, not on the control rod issue. On January 3, 1961, the job of restarting the dormant reactor fell to the swing shift, manned by Dick Legg, Jack Burns, and Richard McKinley. All total, those three men had less than three years' experience working on SL-1, and they had an intimidating laundry list of things to accomplish between 4 p.m. and midnight. They had to pump down the reactor, they had to reassemble the control rods, the connect the motors, and then, you know, at the end of all this, they were supposed to start up the reactor. So it was a lot. It was a lot. It was a daunting list of work to do. They never made it past the third item, reconnecting the drivetrains to the control rods. Operators used the drivetrains to move the control rods up and down as needed. They'd been disconnected for maintenance and now required reattaching. To do so meant standing on top of the reactor and manually lifting up each control rod, ever so slightly, no more than a few inches, to keep from starting a chain reaction in the reactor's core before they were ready for it. Those control rods weren't easy to handle. Each one was 84 pounds. And on that night, the technicians didn't have the help of the drivetrains. They had to use their hands and their own brute strength. Imagine trying to delicately lift a massive metal post into the exact right position. Not too much. And you get the idea of how something could have gone terribly wrong. And at 9.01 p.m. on that cold January evening, the three-man team went to work on rod number nine, the center rod. Jack Burns, who had just found out his wife wanted a divorce, who disliked his boss, Dick Legg, and whom supervisors repeatedly reprimanded for disciplinary problems, squatted over rod number nine and began to lift. It was during this step of the procedure that the reactor went super critical. Basically, all that energy the reactor converted instantly to heat, which converted all the water to steam. Half a second after Jack Burns began lifting, the chain reaction blew out of control, driving the temperature inside the reactor up to 2,000 degrees Celsius, melting the fuel in the core so quickly it vaporized. The water closest to the fuel plates flashed into steam. Now the reactor had turned into an out-of-control pressure cooker, with an incredible amount of radioactive steam and water straining to get out. The force of it launched the 26,000-pound, 16-and-a-half-foot-high reactor tank over nine feet into the air, even though it had been welded to the floor. The control rods and shield plugs, which fit into the top of the reactor to protect workers from radiation, shot through the air like missiles. And one of those shield plugs pierced Dick Legg's body, propelled him upwards, and pinned him to the ceiling. In four seconds, it was all over and an alarm bell rang at the fire station eight miles down the road. I'm not sure there's any question as to whether we could have avoided this incident. Between the design flaws, the shoddy maintenance, the just-make-it-work attitude of the Army, and the inexperience of the men doing the work, it was only a matter of time before things went south. It was an experimental platform, right, which is okay. Like, you have to, when you make new things, there's problems, right? But then to put you know, three kind of operationally trained enlisted dudes in charge of it and leave them alone to run it, like, just seemed like it was just asking for trouble. Like something was going to blow that reactor up. But what caused it? Did Rod 9 stick as it had on so many other occasions? And in struggling to pull it out, Jack Burns lifted it too far? It's almost a certainty that what happened was 
the control rod got lifted something more than four inches. Exactly how far above four inches the rod was lifted and why that happened and how that happened, that's kind of the, the central mystery of SL1. No matter how you slice it, some sort of human error caused this catastrophe. But on what level? Who was responsible? The central control rod came out too far at a nuclear reactor. Was the incident an accident or intentional? Was it institutional negligence or individual error? Did Dick Legg, always joking around, even in the wrong moments, startle his colleague, leading to a fatal error? Or did Jack Burns, distressed at the news that his wife wanted a divorce, commit suicide? And then there was another rumor that seemed to appear from nowhere, that Dick Legg had been sleeping with Jack Burns' wife. There were a lot of a lot of folklore, I think is probably the most accurate word, about how, like, you know, there was a love triangle and this dude killed another guy with a, with a nuclear reactor, basically. That might sound completely insane, but everyone who knows the story of SL1 also knows that piece of salacious gossip. The two are forever intertwined. And it would make sense that the rumors about the men's personal lives might have been beneficial to the officials overseeing the reactor program. The military and the Atomic Energy Commission wouldn't want anyone thinking that the technology was bad, that reactors were dangerous and unstable, or that this kind of incident could happen again. It was much easier to let the rumors that emerged from the rubble of SL-1 take hold and to lay this mistake at the feet of two troubled men who were no longer alive to defend themselves. It would be months before the government wrapped up a formal investigation into what exactly happened on January 3rd, 1961. In the next few episodes, we'll explore the fallout of the SL-1 incident, starting with what do you tell a nervous public about something like this, especially when they start filling in the gaps with rumors? And how do you discern fact from fiction when all the witnesses are dead? That's coming up on the next episode of Wild Thing. You can learn more about the SL-1 accident and the beginnings of the nuclear Navy by reading Todd Tucker's book, Atomic America. Don't have a way to write that title down? I'll put a list of books to read on the website, wildthingpodcast.com. That's wildthingpodcast, all one word. You'll also find more about this season, including how to get Wild Thing t-shirts and stickers. If you're enjoying Wild Thing, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, definitely tell your friends. It really helps get the word out about the show and makes another season more likely. This podcast is a production of Foxtopus Inc. with generous support from First Light Capital. Wild Thing is edited by Alicia Lincoln with sound mixing and music from Louis Weeks. Our executive producer is Scott Carney, and I'm your host and creator, Laura Krantz. 